Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to a September 26th, I'm losing track of the calendar, edition of the MSP Initiative, MSP Talk. Uh, we're going to get some housekeeping out of the way. I literally just came back from the airport, uh, Monday night football in Tampa. Pretty hot during the daytime, I got to I gotta admit. But once uh, the sun went down, much better. I don't know how these people, ha- you know, do the Florida thing with this, you know, 100 degrees humidity and the 100 degree temperature, but I digress. Here we go mspinitiative.com. Here's what we do. Everything we do is on this site. So this session is being recorded. We put it into podcast and video format. You'll find it here under sessions. Of course, it'll be in your favorite podcatchers, et cetera. Don't uh, drive and watch, drive and listen instead. Uh, We had a great first inaugural MSP Community Minds in Denver earlier in August. Uh, This is what we did after we parked the Channel Strong tour bus and decided to go more into an educational format. We really appreciate everybody who was involved in that, and we are planning a couple of these for next year. Again, new, different format, no trade show floor, more learning, right, from the people that are in the sandbox with you. Now we got the last two, and these are the biggest ones of the year, block parties of the year. If you're headed to DadoCon in Miami, like, next week, (laughs) um, on the second night of the conference, this is October 3rd, not the first night, the second night of the conference, we'll be having the official after party, um, which we always call block parties, but that's what we're calling it this time, and it is on the agenda, it is at the Hard Rock, literally, you could walk from the, the main conference hotel down, you know, through the, down, you know, the water, through a little park, it takes five minutes to get there, although we're busing people too, so we'll talk all about that uh, in a little bit, but um, this is going to be great, you know, We've always obviously had a a great time doing these in the past. It's going to be no different. We actually did a combo of two separate venues together. Um, So you'll, uh, there's a pirate ship, there's karaoke, there's a band, there's, you'll, you'll love it. Let's just, you know, keep, make sure that we don't hit Florida weather uh, with the random rain and, you know, that, that has plagued us in the past. And then lastly, if you're, oh, by the way, so October 3rd, 10 till close on the, on the Miami DattoCon event, if you're not going to DattoCon, but you happen to be in South Florida and you just want to come hang out and you're an MSB, just, you can do that, right? Like you don't have to be going to the conference in order to come. Same applies to this next one. If you're headed to IT Nation, on the first night of IT Nation, which is November 8th at Icon Park. So you're driving down International Drive in Orlando, big Ferris wheel, can't miss it. This is where we had the block party last year. Happened to be a tropical storm during this. We still pulled it off. Brought in the All-American Rejects. Absolutely awesome. We are bringing in not one, not two, but three radio recognizable bands. I'll even give you the time period, late 90s, um, to be our uh, entertainment for the evening. So that is November 8th, 9 p.m. to 2 a.m. or close. Um, Again, if you're in Orlando and you're not happening to go to IT Nation, no problem. You can still swing by, but you should register. There's registration links on both of these parties. And we will probably be announcing those bands this week. So stay tuned, watching all the social media, because we're going to be putting it out there, uh, and I'm sure you'll love it. Uh, We have a couple community offers from companies from around the community that are giving you hookups, so check those out. Lastly, and I I get emails about this all the time, the industry calendar. I have probably, I don't know if you guys know this, like just in the U.S. alone in 2023, which is not over yet, It's like 230-ish events that you could possibly go to. It's a lot of events, guys. So I'm already getting all this stuff for next year. I'm probably six months into the year. I'm going to dump all of my homework into this list. Of course, if we're missing anything, you can always submit your event here. We'll pop it in there as well. Just homework for the industry, right? Like, because we're all collecting stuff from all over the place. We're just dumping it into one place. So I digress. That is everything you need to know. MSPinitiative.com. If you can learn how to spell initiative, you can hit that website. All that being said, yes, literally fresh off the plane. Um, just got in and, uh, like I said, went down to that Monday Night Football game. Eagles, Bucks. Finally, the Eagles break the curse. I guess the Buccaneers have had, you know, their way with us for about 10 years now. And I guess they they retired Rondé Barber, you know, Hall of Fame in the ring right during halftime. I was like, oh, yeah, thanks. This guy still remembers, you know, 2003 in Philadelphia. We should have went to the Super Bowl and this guy blew us up. But I digress. There it is. Today's guest speaker uh, on the uh, uh, on the podcast today, longtime friend. Uh, it's been around the industry for a while. Mr. Charlie Tomeo. How you doing, Charlie? Good, George. How's it going? 
whirlwind, man. I mean, you know, a year for the Eagles or what? I, I, I mean, listen, uh, it's in the, the Super Bowl is in Vegas this year. There's no flimsy grass with like, you know, slip and slide action. So if I can get back there, I think I'm going to have, you know, a good shot, right? Where my defense, remember, the Eagles last year had like 82 sacks on the season, but in the Super Bowl, zero quarterback sacks, pressures, hurries, because they were slipping and sliding like they're playing football in the backyard and like, you know, there's puddles on the grass. So I don't know. I digress. I think the Eagles are going to have a great season. Knock on wood. Three and oh, there's only three teams left in the league with an undefeated record. The Dolphins, who I don't know, scored 70 points the other day. Crazy. Wow. Uh, the Eagles and um, 49ers. the 49ers, who I don't know. Every, you know. every time they go into an important game, they lose all their quarterbacks. So I, I, I digress. All right, good. What about the Giants? I know you're a Giants guy. You yeah. like Danny Dimes? That's, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. All right, we'll see. Expect the worst, yeah. hope for the best. 100%. Well, they signed into a contract. They got to pay the guy, whether he's working or not. Um, could be Kirk Cousins. I mean, that could be worse. Uh, anyway, I digress. Charlie, for people who just never ran into you, know you, don't understand your journey through the industry, I always try and start these things off with like, hey, tell us a little bit about your background so that we can, you know, get a little bit of context. So um, go ahead and give your, you know, your little journey through IT land. Yeah, so I've been um, on the vendor side for almost 25 years now. Started out as an SE, uh, worked uh, on the banking side before that. And, um, you know, I was pretty, pretty lucky. I spent most of that time at uh, WebRoot. Uh, I was able to get, you know, Ton of career growth there, made uh, lifelong friends. Uh, so, you know, couldn't have had it. I was truly blessed with what my journey was at Webroot and then came out of there after a couple of acquisitions, uh, spent, you know, two and a half years at uh, Axiant, kind of re help and rebuild that brand. And then, um, you know, recently landed at Roost in the beginning of the year. So, um, pretty excited about that. Um, you know, great CEO, great technology, just overall. Um, Really excited about uh, the tech, the team uh, that's the go-to-market team, and uh, certainly the uh, the smart folks that are uh, definitely smarter than me. I don't know about you, George, but they're they're figuring out how to build this stuff and how to help the MSP community. So, um, for those of you that don't know, Roost, um, we're at a uh, an RPA, a robotics processing automation platform, and uh, we're able to give you the ability to uh, automate and optimize your MSP business. All right. Well, let's unwind that for a second. Um, and we'll go into some other cool stuff because, you know, we know each other pretty well. But um, I don't know if people understand RPA, right? Like traditionally, there's been RMM platforms where if like hopefully you had somebody inside the company that could build scripting, you know, on top yeah. of that. And like a lot of MSPs bought the vision that, hey, you know, this thing's turnkey, everything's built in, you just press a button and it works. I don't think that ever came to fruition, right? Like it was never that Fisher Price. And so like consultants popped out, right? Around the RMM tools to like help you use them basically because they didn't work out of the box. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a lot of conversation around, is the RMM still around in the near future? Like does... Microsoft and Intune, you know, kind of just step all over that and that's going to be the way forward or, you know, like, do you even need an RMM anymore? And, you know, bottom line is if you're doing everything by hand, your labor cost is just going to blow apart the entire model of being an IT services or MSP. We get that. And we've definitely found stories where two, three man MSPs that were really good at DevOps and scripting are right. able to do a lot of business with not a lot of people. I think they were the exception though, right? I don't think that was ever status quo. So like, give us your, like, let's zoom out for a second. Like, I feel like every day a new RMM is popping up or they're rebuilding it. I don't know, uh, depending on what company we're talking about, but does RMM, yeah, you know, like give me your, your forecasting, right? Do you feel the RMM still has a place? And if so, where does RPA in a company like Roost versus that, like, differ from each other. Yeah, I, th I think they're, you know, people are going to need it, right, in some fashion. So like you said, you mentioned, you know, Microsoft, um, you know, I think anybody that's been in the space for a minute, um, certainly on the vendor side, 
always had the threat of Microsoft wiping them off the face of the earth. I remember starting out at Webroot, we were like an anti-spyware, you know, anti-spam, and every, you know, I, I remember being there six months and having it, you know, in all hands, and them saying, "Hey, Microsoft's going to get rid of spam altogether and spyware." So I don't know where we're going to be. And you know, I, I spent another fifteen years there after that, sold it, and you know, it's it's still um, it's still a viable business. So. You know, I, I think something's going to be around it. You know, you, you brought up a good point, which is, um, you know, as somebody that worked kind of a vendor that worked with, you know, all of the different RMMs, you know, you saw over time, most MSPs were the ones that kind of made the RMM that powerful utility, right? I, I know guys that can tell you that they built hundreds of scripts over time to really get what they need out of it. You know, to be fair now, I mean, it's evolved. So you probably don't need scripts to do, you know, a, a big chunk of that. Um, but, you know, it's still a lot of what they're doing is they're, they're automating tasks, specific tasks. So you still have, even though it's, you know, it's something that, you know, you're doing remotely, there's still much, so much manual, you know, intervention to get this stuff done. So the big, the big, you know, difference between what we're looking to do, we're not looking to replace the RMM. We're looking to help you automate the processes that you do every day. And it's, it's, you know, most MSPs could tell you, you know, how many tickets they get for password resets, right? Um, you know, what the level of effort is to onboard and offboard somebody. And, you know, one of the bigger ones is, you know, just auditing, auditing your license counts. There's nothing that, um, and, and you know, I, I think there's plenty of different tools to do these things out there. Um, but if you look at, um, you know, most MSPs, they can't keep on layering on everything else to this, you know, to their stack, right? So uh, that's where I think we, you know, we definitely help you out in uh, that optimization of your MSP. And you don't have to be, you know, operational maturity level. You don't have to be the, you know, the cream, right, of the top, right? You don't have to be in the top five or 10% of these very big, very well-oiled machines. You know, we're seeing, you know, like you said, two-man shops that are very evolved that say, hey, we're going to go do this. I'd rather figure this out. And, you know, happy days. We could, you know, we could save, you know, hundreds and thousands of hours a month. So, you know, I, I think it just depends on uh, where you are in your journey as an MSP, what you're doing, and as you know, our, 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 our space is really kicked up with M&A and, and people have kind of changed the, the way they, they view things, which I think in the past was, you know, who's going to take over for it, right? I mean, you got a young family, you know, do, do, you, do you want your kids going into this business knowing what, you know, what you know today? Maybe, maybe not. It's, I've said, I'm going to keep on saying it because it's true. It's actually a pretty hard business. I mean, like, if you actually zoomed out and said, how can I make money? There's a lot of different paths you could take, right? You could be a franchise of a company. You could start up a, a Chick-fil-A, who knows, right? But I mean, bottom line is being in the IT services business, especially somebody who, you know, maybe was in internal IT, broke out, had to start something on your own, right? The economy changed. And it's a lot of grunt work, to be totally honest. And like, people are always complaining. People are always calling at the most inconvenient time of day, hour, week, whatever. You hear about people never taking vacations and like answering calls at four o'clock in the morning. It's crazy. And, um, you know, ultimately you mature, you add more people, you hope to like find a way not to have that burnout effect, right? By splitting the load out, right? But um, there's only so many hours in the day. That's number one. Number two, your customers always... You know, IT is one of those industries where like, they're never happy, right? They have no idea what you're talking about. They just expect it to work. And like, that's just not how it goes. Right. And um, I just think that, you know, everybody finally discovers, you know, you want to call it the ecosystem, the sandbox, the channel. I don't care what the word is, right? And you show up and like, everybody wants to sell you something. You swipe, you swipe, you yeah, swipe, you swipe. That's it. And then six months later, you're like, holy crap, I'm paying lots of dollars every month, commas and zeros on this whole package of 18 vendors plus, but I haven't even set it up, right? Like I didn't even turn it on yet. Cause like it takes time to turn it on and I don't have time. So like catch 22, all of that being said, 
can you give us an example of like the most common things people have been able to take the roost solution and like what are they doing with it like what what's it solving for yeah, so some of the recent things, like I said, on, onboarding and offboard, I think is is definitely one that everybody has, uh, you know, some pain points with. Um, the other thing is, you know, being able to um, go in and uh, basically make decisions on where a ticket really is. So right now, if you look at a lot of, you know, I'd say medium to high volume MSPs, you know, they have a, you know, they have traffic cops looking at tickets. Yeah, dispatcher. Right. You know, so they have they they, they wind up having a dispatcher there, uh, and you know we're not necessarily looking to to uh, get rid of resources. We're trying to put you in a position where you could take those resources and have them go help you grow your business, as opposed to you know just meeting a certain SLA. So we put some things in place um, today with uh, leveraging AI, where we could actually uh, look at the the body of the ticket to determine. You know, what should that be? And I'll give you an example is, you know, you could get a ticket that just says, hey, you know, my my laptop is not working, mm -hmm. which we, we we all get that. Anybody that's technical at all, either has family, friends or people that they work with that experience that they have those very vague descriptions. It's broken. What yeah. Is that? And then they're like, yeah, my laptop doesn't work um, every time I print. It doesn't print what I wanted it to print. So we clearly know that, but but you know what I'm saying? It, it's definitely not accurate. So it's one of those things where you dig through and that's why dispatchers are there, right? To spend a bit more time to figure that out. But if I said, you know, my laptop's not working and I had a, I have a board meeting in two hours. Mm -hmm. I don't want that just to be in that like, okay, based on a SLA, that's medium. But you know, now we want to make sure we get it to the right person. We get there quick. Right, because as you know, anybody that's in, in IT knows that, you know, ultimately, if you never hear from your customers, you did a great job. Now, the opposite is, you know, they probably don't value it because you're doing such a great job, but that's a whole nother uh, longer conversation. But, you know, it's things like that. It's, um, you know, like you look at the onboarding, you know, how great would it be when, when and, and you've dealt with this, George, where all of a sudden, eight or nine o'clock on a Friday night, one of your customers remembers, oh, I got somebody starting Monday. Oh my God. All the time. Like right? they almost forget that they're like, oh, this person needs a computer and like email and every like, and then they're like, oh, but by the way, they're, they're starting at 9 a.m. in the morning, make sure it's done. And you're like, I have no time to do this. Yeah. Yeah. So that's it. So you get that. And now all of a sudden, if you've had a, uh, basically an automation built, it goes out, it orders the licensing, sets up the accounts it you know it can do everything it, as you know it's one thing that our founders said like if you could think of a process you could automate it but you can't automate something that you don't know what the process is so like how deep are we talking right like when i think about you know bringing somebody in right ordering the license that's cool like that's i think above and beyond in my opinion but like you know, allocating the license, creating the email account, creating the Office 365 account, you know, creating the, you know, uh, you know, the, the login for the computer, adding the applications in that need to be added, you know, and then you have the spam filtering and then by the time you're done, like, it's like 50 steps to onboard something, depending on what's going on. If you, if you could see the way that we even, uh, you know, and our GUI is pretty neat because you could just basically drag and drop all the different integrations we have. Um, what most people do is they chunk that up, right, into smaller workflows. So okay. they do kind of one piece at a time. So they're not trying to do it all at once. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, you know, the really, you know, cool thing is we could add that person, you know, when you go in, they have a form. So now you have your actual end customer filling out a form. If they want to add me to certain groups, they could just drag it, you know, basically that there's just a drop down. They pick what group they want them to be part of. And now all of a sudden I have access to all these things. I'm part of, you know, whether it's SharePoint that I need access, I'm part of marketing. I want to make sure I could get the marketing docs. So it really cleans that stuff up. <laughs> Thanks. Somebody said I'm looking like Dr. Evil today. Sorry, guys. I, I usually was in this <laughs> company non Eagles, or at least come in with the crazy chain and then switch out, but I digress. Um, 
So the idea is that you take all of the things that you swiped your credit card for, you connect them, right, via API yeah. or whatever. Yep. Then effectively, you can begin to say, hey, it takes me four hours to onboard a new person. I can now turn that into 15 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and if you have things, you could actually go in there. Let's say you have something like Adobe, which is not going to be something that is going to be automated. But what we could do is we could send a, we could open up a, a ticket with your PSA, send it to the procurement person and say, I need an Adobe license. And then we Got could it. just put that information in and we can, and, and everything else would have been done. So it's really about that. And we can, uh, we will manage how much time you save. So you could actually go at the, you know, kind of each month, each week and determine you know, what are these automations actually doing? If you're doing something that even saves 10 seconds, if you're doing it hundreds of times a week. Adds up. That adds up. But the other thing that adds up, George, which, which you know, if you talk to the techs, they'll tell you, how many techs want to be bothered with this stuff? They want to be doing the cool stuff, right? They don't want to be that, you know, burnout's got to be huge. We've all, we've all had that job, that repetitive job, you know, um, you know, doing things, working in a deli, this, that, and the other thing where you're just doing the same thing every day, like making the donuts. And so how do you get those smart people and have them do everything, especially do, doing other things that are basically going to be, they're going to be happier, but it's also going to make you more profitable. So I just want to make sure I'm following. Does this, re is this going to replace tools or is this just going to tie into the existing tools in order to do what it does? Yeah. So right now we have, um, you know, about 60 different integrations and we're dropping, you know, a handful, you know, every month. So the, you know, the usual suspects, and I know you're a, a PAX 8 partner. So, um, you know, that would be something that, you know, you could basically connect to PAX 8. You can do that. You know, if you're getting your Microsoft licensing through them, you could manage it through there. Again, it will check to see if you have a license that you actually just recovered from somebody offboarded, so you're not double paying for everything. Um, but it, you know, it's something that um, you know 100, you know, makes it so that uh, we work with you know these other tools that are out there. Okay, so it's like, hey, you have an investment in tools, you're probably not doing it right. So let's find a way to. You know, take all of them in and actually be able to get the machine to run for you so that you don't have to do all the grunt work the hard way the entire way through. Yep. No, that's right. And we could do that. You know, we could also, you know, where we would work with some of those other tools, like we just had released something with uh, Acronis, uh, where we're just making sure and validating that their backups are actually happening if they're not. Yeah. We will go back and we'll kick it off and we'll make sure we get reporting on that. So you know, that's one of those, th those big things with backup, right? Backup's great. You hope you never have to use it, but when you do, you, you, you know, you're hoping and praying that it actually backed up. So this is a way to make sure that we're actually doing those things. So this is really interesting. I mean, I guess, how, you know, back to the whole conversation with the RMM, right? Like, Hey, you know, there was a lot of scripting builds that needs to be done, you know, in order to make it work for you. How much is legwork is involved to actually turn this on and get it to a point where it's working for you? So right now we have a bunch of what we call crates. So uh, anybody that's seen our logo knows that, uh, you know, it's definitely, uh, let's see if we can see, you know, we got the, uh, with the bird there. Right. And, and so, you know, we, we want to put those pre-built workflows for you. We call them crates. Um, so those are things that you could go in and basically just make adjustments to fit your environment. So templates, right? Like they're yeah. pre-built and then you go and just tweak it for you. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Well, that makes it a little bit easier, right? Because like I, I you know, mentioned before, some of these MSPs just don't have like a development or quasi developer on staff, right? Like, you know, they get to the point where they're like, hey, if it's not in the UI, I'm out, right? Like, I don't know what to do. So, you know, if it's easy enough for maybe, a, a, you know, maybe not the, the entry level guy, but what's maybe a level two, level three, maybe you're just yeah. like a loaner to go in, take something that's existing and just adjust it a little bit. 
it's not you don't need to learn a whole new language basically is what i'm saying no that's right and so it, it it's definitely what you know, what you you know refer to as you know low code no code uh we built out a um cluck university so we'll we'll actually train you uh or cluck you as everybody likes to uh wow. refer to it um so so we got cluck you we have um ama calls that we have uh weekly uh, we also have uh, something that I have to tell you scared the daylights out of me when I first started, which is a open mic call that we have every Friday. And um, I'd say we're averaging probably 80, 80 people on each call. Wow. And, uh, the cool thing is that they have almost taken over the call. So we'll give an update. We'll, we'll talk about what we're doing. Uh, we have our CTO, CEO, a bunch of our, our rock people, which is our robotics operations center. And then um, these guys share the stuff that they're building. And it's, uh, and it's pretty, uh, pretty cool. Some of the stuff, you know, is th they're actually taking it to help them manage their personal lives, right? So somebody built one that uh, basically could look at Steam and it would send an alert every time they had a sale on, on certain games. So they didn't have to go to the website, didn't have to look at emails. He'd get an alert uh, to let him know. But um, they're super creative. We also have, um, you know, Wednesdays is Workflow Wednesday. So our partners are actually sharing what they're building. So if yeah. you follow, follow Roost, you'll be able to see that. But, um, you know, we're, we're really trying to put us in a, you know, put the MSP community in a position where everyone, um, you know, can afford automation, but they're also going to be capable of managing and leveraging it. We don't want it to be just another tool. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, I, I really feel like this is a newer category, right? I mean, the word automation has been around and been used forever, maybe even overused, Charlie, but um, RPA is a relatively like, at least to the MSP, you know, IT community, it's a relatively new word, right? It's like a new category that's not been around for too long. Yeah, no, it's, it, I mean, it's one of those things. It's not something we created, right? It, but it's um, very enterprise focused. If you go look at who's out there and um, there's, and it's, and it's really, it, we almost get priced, you know, out of the market, the MSP space, um, because, you know, it's, it's again, one of those things where, um, you know, our, our founder, uh, Aaron Chernin is, you know, he founded Perch, um, has a background of, uh, security, but most people don't know his real background was automation and it was automation secure, uh, automating security. Mm. So once he, you know, he did the perch thing uh, and went through that journey, he was like, this has got to be something I could help the MSP community with. No, that makes sense. I mean, so let me zoom out a little bit and let me take some of the business model check boxes out of here. Um, is Roost selling to internal IT as well as MSP or is it just MSP channel only? We're just MSP. We're MSP focused. Um, you know, what I found, uh, you know, I kind of learned it the hard way at Webroot is, uh, you know, especially when you're building out a small team, building out a brand, um, you know, you, you, you need to, you need to do something extremely well first before, before you try to do everything. Mm -hmm. so, is usually what happens if you try to do everything, everything is subpar. Yeah. As opposed to you being really good at something. And I do think this is definitely one of those things that, um, you know, this community needs. That's cool. And then like, is it a three-year contract or how does it work? <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's basically um, the first 90 days is, is what we agree on just because of the amount of time between onboarding, setting up, and then it's month to month after that. You could buy through PAX 8 um, today. Uh, or you could buy direct. So we're on the marketplace at PAX 8. That's cool. I mean, month to month sounds great. I mean, everybody loves that until for some reason it gets turned off, but that usually comes with the big guys coming in with the blueprint, right? Every time we hear, you know, of an investment or an outside PE, VC, I don't care, you know, you know, pick whatever word you want. There's a lot of them. It usually comes with, hey, we need to, we need to put everybody into three-year contracts and minimums and, you know, uh, all of a sudden it gets a little bit more not friendly. Yeah. We, you know, I, I think we, we wind up getting people asking for contracts more oh. so just to make sure that they are, you know, they, they love what we're doing. They're excited about it. And just to make sure that their price doesn't go up. Right. Because okay. that goes, that goes both ways, right. With month to month. 
you know, it's it's a lot easier to raise uh, raise the contract. But you know, the the three years just doesn't uh, it doesn't fit. It didn't fit our model um, at Axiant or at Weber either. So I agree. That, uh, that that made sense. But you'd, you'd be surprised how many people are okay with one year. They feel like, hey, I'm going to make a commitment for it. And ultimately, as you know, George, if uh, the stuff doesn't work, you got to do the right thing. No, you're right. I mean, and, and you know, of course, there's a perception there too, right? The idea that it works or doesn't work versus does it really work? I <laughs> sometimes don't align, but, you know, as we both know, right? I mean, no reason to, to run after a relationship you don't want to be in either, right? Like might as well just settle, set, you know, set the bed call everything what it is and move on. I mean, totally agree, you know, with that. Um, what about co-manage, right? What about these, um, you know, MSPs that have, you know, are working with, you know, people who have internal IT staff of some level. Like, do you see people extending some level of access to their downstream customer or is this more behind the scenes just from the MSP standpoint? What we're starting to see is that people are building, it's, you know, so, so initially they fine tune it, they leverage the automation internally, and then they sell it as a service to their end customers. Okay. Right? So, so they go in as the automation experts and they will automate their end customers. Okay. And so like the forms that you were talking about earlier with offboarding and onboarding were like the end customers checking things. I assume that's customized for the end customer. That's right. You know, for each one separately, because, you know, who knows what they have. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So, cool. so it, you know, I mean, that's the thing that th this was definitely purpose built for MSP, right? It's multi-tenant. Uh, the contracts, as you know, uh, is, is definitely the month to month is definitely uh, an MSP thing. And really those integrations, you know, those integrations are with your uh, usual suspects, you know, all the RMMs, the PSAs, you know, you'd have majority of those in there. That's cool. And then, um, you know, I'm average, right? By the time somebody signs up, to the, is it do they usually get it functional within that ninety day window that you're talking about before? Is that the average? Or yeah, we actually went. We've gone down with our onboarding, so it was around ninety days. And now what we're seeing is, um, you know, people are probably graduating out of that in you know thirty five days at this point. Okay. And so what? Um, one of the things that they're doing that they're leveraging it is we're coming in, we're trying to understand the business, we're trying to look at, um, you know, what some of their problems are. And so they're going for a lot of the pre-built workflows and getting those in so that they're seeing value. You know, the biggest thing is just getting that time to value. And then on things that may be a bit more complex or they're still working on what that process looks like, you know, you'd be surprised that a lot of people don't even know what the full onboarding process looks like because so many people manage a dis different aspect of it. And as you know, like, you know, that, that saves time, but it also is a pain point for the end customer. That's true. No, that's true. I mean, one of the things with the RMMs and the scripting and everything that's involved there is sometimes the script breaks and then the auto, like what was supposed to be automated turns into a, fact-finding mission, right? To figure out why it's not working anymore. We know in IT land, things change on the regular, right? So what you, you know, you wrote, you know, some API connection before, maybe it's changed, maybe what the language is different, whatever. Um, how easy is it for someone to diagnose why something didn't happen? You know, like at so, that point you say, hey, don't get stuck in the weeds, contact our support team, they'll figure it out for you or... So that's that's some of the keys, George. Yeah. So we, we do we do leverage Discord. So it's very from a support standpoint. So Rock looks at that. That is very a you know a tech techie based tool, right? You know, my kids were looking at my uh, phone and like, why do you have Discord on your phone? You shouldn't have Discord, right? So shaming me for my age, but uh, you know, it's it's it, it's interesting that what we're doing is we're managing. Uh, and it's the reason why we have those integrations. Like we have a couple that will be dropping soon with LionGuard and SonicWall. Um, and really we manage, we have that rock team that's that's looking at managing any changes to that API, right? Because as we all know, people just change the API and then all of a sudden shockingly it breaks stuff. So that's one of the things. 
Uh, the other thing is that they're looking for failures as well. So as workflows fail, and um, we're definitely able to help determine that. Um, but it will show you where things in that workflow, where it failed. So okay. it's very, you know, it's very intuitive. They could go, um, they could figure out, but then they also, you know, have access to that support team and um, use it. It's amazing to see how many of our actual uh, partners that are solving problems. Because as you know, you know, you talk about this like community channel, like this is probably the best thing that ever happened, you know, to, to me from a career standpoint is understanding like what a big difference MSP is compared to, you know, you know, let's say even traditional distribution and VAR and it's just so tight knit. And once you figure that out, um, you know, you, you know that, um, you know, it's the, the, the live and die by the sword too, right? So you got to make sure you always do that you're doing the right thing or at least um, or, or, or communicating. But um, having those guys and having those warriors that go in successful, know how we're helping their business have done a great job in helping helping um, us actually grow our business this year. That's awesome. I, I love the, I mean, you, you've been full gamut now, right? You were in like the very big company, <laughs> you know, a couple of acquisitions. Now you're back in startup mode. Um, I, I almost, I, you know, we've talked about this a little bit, but I'll say it here now, right? It's kind of the fun time of business building, right? Like this is where you can experiment and decide, you know, figure out what works, what doesn't, uh, you know, workshop things a, a little bit to figure out that, you know, fine tune, you know, when you get to a much larger company, it's kind of hard to do those micro movements, right? Cause the boat's bigger, right? Um, yeah, it takes, it takes forever. Right. So one thing is, you know, we're, we're you know, we're constantly trying to fine tune our messaging you know, we're, we're listening to, to our partner base and, uh, and we're making adjustments. So, you know, from that standpoint, I think it's, um, I'm having a ton of fun. You know, I, I work with a great group of people and, and it's not that I, I've worked with great, great groups of people in the last, you know, two places. Um, but this is really just, um, you know, a ton of fun. And as you know, the way the space is, there's a couple of people that, um, that I worked with in the past that were already here. And they were like, this is unbelievable. You got to see what we're doing here. Um, so, so for me, I just like, you know, it, it, it's real fun. It's different, you know, to your point, George, like not everybody's doing it. Um, so it's a different, you know, it's a different story. The, the last thing I'd want to be doing is, you know, trying to convince you to go buy a different endpoint security after I told you for years, what the greatest one was and, and those type of things. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely enjoying it. That's cool, man. Um, you know, coming back to the bigger picture story, right? I mean, seeing a lot of like the economy still a little bit, you know, uncertain in a couple of areas. We've, you know, we've obviously seen the bigger guys in the space. You know, there was people waiting for IPOs. There was people waiting to sell. Uh, I think I don't know if you saw in the headlines last week, uh, Sentinel One was close to a deal with Cisco. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, after they did the like the 11th hour due diligence, they're like, nope, we're out. And your valuation's not right because your math isn't right. Um, part of it was the projected revenue versus the actual revenue, right? And like how that's reported. So I'm wondering if that's a sign in the industry that people are past due on their bills or, you know, maybe the economy's, you know, starting to create net. 60, 90, 120, rather than, you know, getting paid same day. Like you've been around the block now for a while. You've seen these economic kind of shifts. Um, at some point it does catch up to MSP land. Everybody says there's a buffer. I, I believe it. But at some point, if your customer is not paying their bill on time, it does affect everyone. Right. So what do you think based on where we're at, you know, September 26th, 2023, do you think the impending doom that everybody projected at the end of this year is, you know, was exaggerated and like things are actually a little calmer than they thought it was going to be? Or are we finally starting to see the receipts bubble up that people are past due on their bills? Yeah, I, I think it's uh, interesting because, you know, we've seen, you know, I went, went through the, uh, you know, obviously I'm old enough, went through you know, on the vendor side, the, you know, kind of the economic meltdown and housing crisis and, and kind of 
saw all that. And, and that was uh, honestly before I started to focus on MSP. But you know, then you look at um, you know, the lockdown. Lockdown was really tough. And so you know, I, I think one of the things that um, most MSPs did a good job of uh, during that is they kept busy, right? You talk to anybody, most of them were going into the office, um, you know, during it. Um, they didn't take this big, you know, uh, work from home uh, and they were trying to help people out. I think that um, most of them diversified. So some of them did get hurt, right? If you were in hospitality, George, I mean, you know, um, I know personally, we, we wrote off some business to help out the MSPs because what are you going to do? going to hold them to even a one year uh, when, you know, when, when, you know, some restaurant went out of business or, um, you know, some retail chain. So I, I don't see it as being um, that doom and gloom for us, but it, it is a tough economy, right? Everybody's paying more for everything. doesn't matter. It has no, nothing to do. And, and MSP world is not insulated, right? So we can't, you know, it's not that, uh, you know, you're rolling trucks, you know, if gas is a couple of dollars more than you were paying or what you projected, uh, it's a problem. But I, I, I do think that um, it's not as bad, but I do think, you know, certain, you know, as we see, there's always new vendors. Um, I, think, I think the over hiring based on the growth probably was the bigger issue that we've seen. And, you know, you don't have to be, you, you don't have to be in the know, you don't have to make an announcement. All we have to do is go on LinkedIn, right? We know it. We, you know, you, it's very easy. You and I have talked about this. You read the tea leaves on LinkedIn. Someone's post change a little bit, and then, you know, magically, you know, two weeks later, they're talking about uh, that they need they need a job, they need help. Um, but I think overall, we've done uh, we've done a pretty good job as a community. I just think, uh, you know, I I always I went through a bunch of those things, even managing an SE team, you know looking at layoffs every six months, things like that. And it's, and it's terrible. It's a miserable place to be. Yeah. So I, I always like to be pretty thoughtful with uh, how you hire uh, because ultimately most people are leaving a job to come work. So you better do your best to make sure that they uh, have a job at the end of it. But I think overall, I think we've, we've fared pretty well. Most people that I'm talking to, uh, are seeing growth. You know, I think there were a couple of months, you know, usually the summer months are always like a weird, weird time for us. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, as far as risk goes, you know, we're having a good year and, uh, you know, knock on wood, you know, we continue, we continue that growth, but yeah, I, I just would be mindful on, you know, how you're spending the money, like, you know, events, you know, I think there's certain things when you talk about like, you know, what do we think, you know, potential things to change is, um, you know, my advice for what it's worth, and you, you could kind of do whatever you want with it. Like when you had a big company that had an unlimited, you know, limited budget in some respects, yeah, it's okay to do all these different, you said what, 200 and something events, um, you know, just, you know, just spend your dollars widely, wisely, make sure you understand what you're planning on get getting out of it. Um, if you're investing in it. Yeah. I mean, not for nothing, right? If, you know, if a lot of people don't go to events, I would say the 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 secret of the whole thing is that of a hundred percent of the possible MSPs that could go to an event, probably a little, maybe like sub ten percent actually make it out of their business, you know, office, home office, trunk <laughs> to actually make it to an event because they're too busy running their businesses, right? Yeah. Um, that being said, um, I think there's definitely been this concept of event fatigue, uh, um, too many yeah. events. And I think part of it is that, you, you know, what worked for you in the beginning, the content and the things that you're trying to learn as you're going through your journey changes, right? So back to your point, like when you go to an event, I think your advice is really good. What do you, you know, plan what your outcome is, right? Are you trying to solve a particular question or you trying to find somebody that's been through a specific thing that you're in the middle of or about to go through, or, Hey, um, you're just trying to figure out what everybody else is seeing out there so you can be proactive or whatever it is. But I would argue, Charlie, the best part of any event is the networking with everybody else that does what you do. I mean, 
that's the real information. No, that's, that, that's absolutely right. And I think the other thing is that, uh, you know, if you're not sure what to do, you know, or, or, or why you'd go to an event, if you're looking at it, go look at the website, see who the sponsors are and reach out to one of us. Mm -hmm. Hey, well, you know, you know, why, why are you compelled to go do this? And, you know, yeah. because, because I do think that, you know, that's one of the things that, you know, you get real life. The, the other thing, George, that, you know, if you, if you don't put together your, you know, ideal partner profile mm -hmm. and you don't know who you're actually, you know, who your partner is that you're looking for, um, you know, I'd argue that, you know, how could you make a, a great decision on where to, where, what events to go to, you know, that's, that's you know, true. You know, because if you're if you're looking for the you know the guys that are kind of up and coming, if those are your you know those are your people, right? Where you you're really successful with, you know, maybe going to one of these really large events isn't the place for you. You know, I maybe you know what I mean. Maybe you go to some of these uh, you know th these these other ones. So it's just really determined on uh, what you want to get out of it. Um, also, um, you know, as you do that reverse waterfall, just making sure that, you know, are these the events that are going to help you get enough at bats to hit the numbers that you're targeting? No, that's fair. I mean, at the end of the day, like whether you're an attendee and you're an MSP and you're spending time out of the office to go to the event or your vendor sponsoring an event, I think the reality is that the reason people invest in all of this is because it's still the best way to communicate and network and uh, meet people and like have a business conversation or even a quasi business conversation. But at the end of the day, there has to be a plan, right? Like yeah. if you're trying to take a vacation, okay. But I would say most people are after a business objective, right? And so, you know, take a real honest look at everything and just decide whether you're, you know, going to have a lunch on somebody or <laughs> you're actually going to go and learn something to help your business. And as a vendor, I agree with you, Charlie. I mean, you could drop millions of dollars on this stuff. <laughs> it's just crazy. Um, we talk, me and you talk about ROI on this stuff all the time. And um, I feel like it's this vague thing that people are like, oh, well, if, if I show up, they will come. I think we've both been around long enough to know that that's not there's really no guarantee, right? Zero, nothing. No, I, I think it's, yeah, you know, I mean, th that's the other thing is you, it's not, it's not that clean, right? It's not, you know, you go there, you spend this much and this is, you know, how much you're going to get back because, you know, there is the other thing is, you know, building brand, make sure people will see you, right? You know, you, you know, you want people to understand that, um, you know, I mean, it's, it, it's really odd to see where, where I'd miss a show at times over the years that I'd gone to and everyone's like, Oh, I thought something's going wrong. I thought the business wasn't well, mm -hmm. uh, is there something I need to worry about? And, um, so I, you know, I think there's, there, there's definitely good value there, uh, with, you know, getting your brand out there, doing those things, but, um, you know, it's just put your plan together, look at, uh, you know, it sounds like, you know, uh, they could go to your website and look at all the different events over time. And um, just plot that out to help you be successful. I mean, you know, that's the other thing is it's uh, we're going into Q4. Now everyone's got to be planning already uh, for next year. So that's that is very true. It happens fast too, hundred uh, percent. A little bit on the back end here. Yeah, I think me and you travel quite a bit. Um, you you have a lot better success at airport security than I do for some reason. <laughs> uh, we could we could wonder why. Um, What's your, what's your best travel advice, right? To people who, you know, maybe aren't the avid traveler like you are, right? But like every time they go, it's like maybe not the best experience. Well, what are, what are some tips that you might give people? Yeah, it's, I mean, it, it's miserable, right? I mean, you know, now I would, I would say, you know, try to work on status, but it, anybody that's looked at recently, they make status uh, pretty hard. But, um, you know, depending on how often you're going to travel, you know, I, I, I tried something early in my career and then I just start, started using it recently. And uh, you and I have caught up is, is maybe the lounge which helps you get status. I think those things help, but um, it's been rough travel. Move to a place that has a better airport than uh, Newark, maybe. Uh, you know, I think, I think that could be one of those things, but 
Yeah, I would just make sure that you plan out, make sure that you have enough time on all ends because I, I don't like being late for things. I don't like missing flights. Been a lot, it's been a bumpy year for flight cancellations and delays, that's for sure. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. So you really can't, um, you know, it used to be that you could get to the airport 20 minutes before your flight, go through security. I mean, even now. Um, for me. <laughs> you know, I have, you know, global entry, clear, and uh, Newark has a new terminal, a terminal in it. This has happened three times in the past two months where there's an alarm that trips. Oh, yeah. The door or something. And now they have these gates. So they, as soon as that alarm trips, the gates come down and everyone stops work and they stop looking at people. And it's uh, it's miserable. They must just go on a break because then by the time they get the alarm fixed, they close the door or whatever, uh, it takes probably uh, 20 minutes to a half hour to get them going again. So so I had, there must have been, I don't know, three, 400 people waiting on the clear TSA pre-check line. Wow. So, you know, just uh, definitely prepare for the worst. Technology sounds great. Yeah. When it's not working, painful. Well, well, the problem with all that too is that you, you know you're paying for it. So you're not earning it. So early on, TSA pre-check was kind of like, hey, it's you know, you're the, the the frequent traveler. It was easy. You could walk, you know, as fast as you could walk through, you'd get through. Now it's not not so much. Yeah. Well, and especially with international travel, that just adds another layer, right? Yep. Yeah, that's, uh, that's it. It'll be fun, but you know, we get, we, uh, we got a good, uh, you know, solid end to the year. I think we're doing about seven more events, uh, to close this things out. And, um, you know, I just, uh, for, for me, just wish, uh, you and everybody else well on it. I mean, close out the year strong and then, uh, hopefully you build, uh, you close enough stuff out in December. So it uh, hits revenue in, uh, in January to start your year off strong. It's the yearly circle. Um, where do people find out more about Roost, the MSP program, how to talk to somebody and all that jazz? Yeah, like I said, you know, you know, LinkedIn, go out, follow Roost. You could, uh, you know, connect with Roost online. Uh, you could find out about Clark University there. And certainly anybody that uh, needs anything personal, just reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, last name is T-O-M-E-O. And um, be more than happy to help you and, and certainly uh, love connecting and meeting new people. Awesome. Charlie, thanks for stopping in. Thanks, I'm George. Good luck to the Eagles. Yeah, thank you. Good luck to your Giants. Yeah, we'll see you Monday, I think. Yeah, 100%. You're going to see me on Monday. Thanks, everyone, for watching. This is recorded. You'll find it at mspinitiative.com under session shortly. And uh, check out roost.com. I O. Roost.io, R E W S T.io. Yep, I think I got it. Uh, appreciate appreciate your time, Charlie. Uh, thank you, everyone, for jumping in. We'll keep these going Tuesdays, Thursdays, one o'clock Eastern time. Of course, we'll post them at msbinitiative.com. Catch you on the next one. See ya.